Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? I'll give it to Dr. Stormy. All right. Thank you, Ty. Uh, go ahead and make sure everybody knows if, you've, if you're interested in the report from the Commodity Commission, uh, research are on the back table, so go ahead and pick those up if you're interested. Uh, the EPA speakers are not going to be here today, so we're not going to closely follow the program. Stanley said I could have all their time if I really wanted it. Uh, but uh, so we'll. We may not follow that uh, schedule that you that you see as closely as, as some of you might like, but that's what we're going to do. Uh, talk a little bit about insects and insecticides. Uh, I'll show you some information. I want to recognize my co-authors here, Dr. Riley and Ty, uh, as they contributed some of the information, the, the data that you'll see. Start out with a very brief discussion of chlorpyrifos or Lors ban. Hopefully, everybody realizes it's going away. Uh, and that you, we've known this was coming for a couple of years. Uh, so hopefully you've been looking at some of your alternatives for that, where, you, where it plays an important role in your, in your program. The big date we're looking at right now is February 28th. That is when the tolerances disappear. Now, what does that mean as far as your use right now? If you've got Lord's ban and you're thinking about using it, is up until February 28th, if you use it, Irrespective of when you harvest, your tolerance is based on the tolerance we currently have. The date that you use it is the tolerance that we have now will apply. If you apply it after February 28th, the tolerance is zero. All right, so if you've got Lohr's ban, you ought to be looking at trying to use it according to label prior to February 28th. And if you do that, you want to make sure you should already be keeping records. If you see the bottom down there, evidence to show that the food was lawfully treated may include records that verify the dates when the pesticide was applied. So if you harvest in March and they say, hey, you've got Lohr's ban, you need to be able to show, hey, I applied it in January or February and the old tolerance is, is what we're working under. After February 28th, again, it goes to zero. If you are importing, the same thing's going to happen. That tolerance is going to zero. That's one of the reasons there was this six-month delay from when the rule was implemented and tolerances disappear. It's because they're working with the international organizations. So EPAs are saying even with imported produce, February 28th, those tolerances disappear. Now, there's still questions about legal use and blah, blah, blah. If we have no residue, what happens? And I was hoping EPA would be here to answer those because I don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, I can tell you Canada is, it has existing stock provisions they've already announced. I don't think that's going to happen in the U.S. because we're going to that zero tolerance. If I had Laura's ban, I would look at using it legally prior to February 28th. Or I'd be looking for, I don't know what they're going to do. The companies haven't really discussed the, how they're going to get rid of stocks and all of that at this point. Uh, the only legal uses after February 28th, that looking at the label that I could see, are going to be Christmas trees and turf. All food uses will be gone. All right, new insecticides. That's a really talk, short talk because we have no new insecticides. We have a few new formulations that I think you need to be aware of. A... Uh, new premix to be aware of, and a product that's been registered for a couple of years, but I just missed, and I don't know how, but I have. Uh, Movento is going to be replaced entirely by Movento MPC. All right, the MPC, Movento MPC is a less concentrated formulation, and you're going to put out the same amount of AI per acre, so it's less concentrated, so you're just simply going to put more of the product out. It has all the same labels, all the same restrictions, and everything else. Uh, did probably five or six trials with it this year, and it's the same efficacy if you put out the same amount of active ingredient. Uh, so that's really just a, a formulation change. The other thing you need to remember with Movento, and it's true with Movento MPC, is you need to put a penetrating surfactant with it. One of the big advantages of this product is that it moves in the plant extremely well. It will move up and down in the phloem and xylem, which nothing else really does, but it needs help getting into the plant, so you need that penetrating surfactant. 
Vanicor from FMC is a new formulation of chlorinchinellaprole, which is the active ingredient in Corrigin. It is a more concentrated formulation, so there's more product per gallon, so you're going to have lower use rates per acre, but you still use the same amount of AI per acre. Now, the other thing FMC has told me, I don't deal with buying products too much, but they're telling me it's going to be a cheaper product. But you have to keep in mind also, it is a targeted uh, crops on this. It's not registered everywhere corrigan is going to be registered. On vegetables that uh, are probably important to us in the southeast that is labeled are sweet corn, the legumes, beans and peas, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and carrots. So this, it's, it's targeting these specific markets uh, because of, of cost restrictions. Elevest, also from FMC, a new uh, premix of bifenthrin, a pyreth pyrethroid, and chlorinchinillaprol, which is the corrigin active ingredient again. Uh, I think most people are already familiar with my opinion on premixes. Uh, in entomology, we have the advantage of knowing specifically what we're targeting, and if we've got one pest to target, typically we only need one active ingredient. Premixes do play a role, though, where we've got multiple pests. Say you've got a stink bug and you need the pyrethroid, the bifenthrin, and then you've got caterpillars or white flies and you want to use corage, and that's where you would look at using uh, the, the premixes. And that's the way I look at all premixes. And then the last one is Magister from Gowan. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's actually been registered since 2019, but I've missed it out. Uh, I got interested in this product this year when I was sitting in a meeting and somebody mentioned that Magister was really good on broad mite, which has become a, a more consistent problem for us. Uh, so I looked it up and found it, and it is registered. It is in a caricide. It does two-spotted mites and broad mites. Uh, unfortunately, it is a group 21A, which is the same as portal and Torac. So it gives us a different chemistry, not a different chemistry, a different active ingredient, but it's not something that you, that you would rotate with those two. It's, it's one you would select among those three. Uh, broad mite is one I want to discuss because it is becoming a, a much more consistent problem for us. It's a difficult pest to deal with, first of all, because it's very small. If you look at that picture up in the top there, that's uh, broad mites on a white fly. So they're very small, hard to detect. The female looks like it's got six legs. It's actually got eight, but that last leg is really, really thin. If you're looking for broad mites on a plant, what a lot of people will, will notice are these mites, that picture right here. These mites running around carrying another mite, and they think, well, that's great. I've got a predatory mite attacking the broad mites. That's actually the males, and they'll carry the females from location to location, so they're moving them from leaf to leaf. What you want to look for if you, to make sure you know you've got broad mite, if you look for the eggs, they're about half the size of a female. If you look at them closely, they look speckled, and if you see that speckled egg, you know you've got broad mites. Now, broad mites tend to be a fall problem for us, at least in Georgia, because they, they don't like hot, dry weather like two-spotted mites. They like warm, humid weather, which tends to be more in the fall for us. They have an extremely wide host range, which includes cotton, by the way, but in most crops, they're not a big problem because they just don't cause enough direct damage. Where we have problems are in peppers and eggplant because peppers and eggplant are extremely sensitive to feeding by broad mites. A uh, very low population on an eggplant or pepper causes a systemic response in the plant, and you get deformations, damage that looks pr particularly uh, similar to virus damage. Uh, the, another thing that makes them difficult to deal with is by the time you see the damage, they're very small, so they're hard to detect. By the time you see the damage, they've probably been in the field about two weeks. And after you control them, that damage will continue to show up for about two weeks. So just managing them is a little bit difficult. In peppers, uh, you see there to the upper left and upper right the type of damage you get. Uh, this lower left, this squiggly main vein in the leaf is kind of unique to broad mites in peppers. And you get deformation and, and discoloration of the fruit. 
In eggplant, the primary thing you'll see is the deformation, discoloration of the fruit. You don't see a lot of, of uh, foliar symptoms. In peppers, if you're looking for broad mites, you've got to look right in the terminal. Once that leaf unrolls, flattens out a little bit, they've already moved up to the terminal again. So if you're looking for broad mites in peppers, you get damage in multiple leaves because it's been happening for a while but you'll only find the mites primarily in the terminals. In eggplant, if you ever look at an eggplant terminal under a microscope, it's just a mass of spines. There's nothing there. On eggplant, you've got to go down to about the third to fifth leaf to find them. So just determining that you've got a broad mite problem is a little bit of a problem as well. Controlling broad mites is not the same thing as controlling two-spotted mites. They're a different group of mites. We've got three different groups that we deal with. Mostly we deal with the tetranicids, which are the two-spotted mites in, in related species. Broad mites are tarsonemids, and not everything that works on a two-spotted mite will work on broad mites. Pretty much all the acaricides we have will work on two-spotted mites in related species, but broad mites are a little bit different. And uh, we did a test this year to look at some of these products. We already knew Agrimec and Portal were pretty good products on broad mite, but had never done any real work really with Magister or Torac. Uh, this is some work that Ty did. Ty did all the hard work. He did all the microscope work on this one. Uh, but you see we got very good activity out of Magister and Torac. So we got pretty good activity out of all of those. We do get good activity on broad mite. We don't zero them out in this case. Uh, but good activity, again, the bad news is that the portal, magister, and torac are all the same mode of action. So those are not ones you'd want to rotate. Those are ones you'd, you'd select one of the three and maybe rotate with Agrimec or, or another product. The, the only other product that we really have right now that I'd say is really good on broad mites is Oberon. It wasn't in this test because Oberon's really slow. And this is where we were looking at a test where we knew we had high populations and we wanted to knock them down. That's not where Oberon's going to fit in the system. Oberon's going to be used more in a preventive manner. And we'll talk more about that in the pepper session tomorrow. Another pest that's becoming more po uh, common for us, I believe, is uh, aphids, and particularly green peach aphid. Haven't dealt a whole lot with green peach aphid until about probably the last three to five years. And when I get an aphid call, this first question I ask is, what aphid do you have? and never have I had that answered. Uh, and it makes a difference. Uh, the primary aphids we deal with would be like turnip aphid. It's probably the primary one we have, used to have in uh, cold crops. You can identify it by if you look at the immatures, they've got these dark bands across the back. Uh, the, the winged adult is kind of a, a dark olive color instead of a lime color. Uh, that's turnip aphid. Typically, we can control it with pyrethroids and a variety of products. The cotton aphid, melon aphid, you can tell it. If you look at the immatures, they've got these dark cornicles, tailpipes, which the other aphids don't have, so you'll know you have got cotton aphid or melon aphid. Green peach aphid, what you got to look at there to, to kind of determine what you got. If you looked at the wing form, they've got this, it's not a dark patch, but it's a patch on the abdomen that those other aphids don't have on the wing forms. If you really want to make sure you have it, you look at the antenna. And at the base of the antenna, there is a knot on the inside of each one that faces each other. And if you see that knot on those antennae, you know you've got green peach aphid. Now, why are we worried about green peach aphid? It's because green peach aphid is right up there with diamondback moth on a worldwide basis as far as insecticide resistance. So when I get a call and they've sprayed things that sh normally control aphids, it's normally, it's, and it hasn't worked, it's usually green peach aphid. To give you an idea of how bad it can be, the first time I dealt with green peach aphid in Georgia was probably 15 years ago in a pepper field. I got a call on two different days from two different people about aphids that had been sprayed and they didn't get control. And, I, and we came down to, well, you probably need to try a neonicotinoid. One of them decided to sell, the other one decided to tara. It ended up being the same field. They went to the grower, one of them said you need to spray a cell, the other one said you need to spray a catara. Two neonicotinoids, he tank mixed it. Full rates of both and did absolutely nothing to the population. So the resistance can be severe. One of the things we looked at this year again with Ty 
is some of the alternative chemistries that we can use for aphids. Uh, and it's like Movento, Safina, PQZ. PQZ was one I was really interested in because it's we haven't done any work with it in aphids. Uh, and we were interested in whether or not we had a rate effect as well. The Movento in this case doesn't look great, but I really think Movento is probably going to be a good product on green peach aphid. It just takes a little longer because of its mode of action. You can see that we got good activity with both Safina and both rates of PQZ. So with PQZ, I think uh, we can probably use a lower rate uh, for aphid control, even if it's green peach aphid. Can't really do an insect talk about South Georgia without uh, talking about diamondback moth. We're still working with it extensively. We're still running bioassays. Don't put a lot of emphasis on what happened here because it changes field by field. And that's the reason we're still doing all these bioassays. I will tell you one of the things that's of concern, if you look over here at the Harvanta, XRL, and Corrigin, the group 28s, all the bioassays we ran last year look similar to that. The group 28 insecticides used to be that Corrigin fell out and then sometimes XRL would work, Harvanta would work. I've not seen that in the last year. I think that resistance is broad spread uh, and very stable. So the group 28s are not going to, I don't think, are going to be a, pro, a, a good choice for diamondback control for us. All of the others bounce up and down, field by field. Uh, the one that probably still shows the most consistent results is Proclaim. Uh, if you look over there, the best one in this particular test was Dibrome. Some fields, Dibrome fails, it'll be 20%. So it varies field by field other than that. The other thing I noted this year is, is particularly because TORAC was in there. You look at this one, TORAC gave us absolutely no control. But the other thing we started looking at is if you started looking at these discs where we do these bioassays, 72 hours after putting them in there, uh, it was obvious that we had tremendous suppression of feeding, both with Avant and TORAC. Uh, you know, you might have eight out of 10 healthy larvae on that, to let it look healthy on that TORAC disc, but absolutely no feeding. So we're getting some advantages there other than just mortality. You would assume those will eventually die, but at three days, they're still alive. Uh, we've had some other interest in investigating some other approaches for diamondback moth control. We had some conversations with some consultants and growers out of Florida and the company that does the self-limiting gene in diamondback moth. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, this is a bioengineered diamondback moth where uh, if you feed it tetramycin, it produces normally. If you take that out of the diet, all of the females die. Males reproduce and grow normally. The larvae die very early in development if they're female. The idea is that you mass rear them because you give them the tetracycline, then you take that, then you leave them out, take it out, produce only males, release that into the field, they mate with the wild population, you get only male larvae out of that as far as surviving. It works in the lab, they've, worked, it's, they've got, had success, limited success in some small field experiments. The question is how do you implement that in a grower's field or a greenhouse? Because you're talking about two or three generations before you see the impact and you can't control those caterpillars during that time. Because if you use an insecticide, those lab-reared caterpillars are very susceptible. And the field population is not, as you all know. So great technology, figuring out how to use it, we're still looking at. The company is figuring out whether or not it might be economical or not as well. So we're looking at some of that, but at this point, that looks down the road a ways. Two that we are working with is the spear lip, the peptide-based insecticides. They've actually got two products, a spear T, which is not labeled for a lot of field uses. Higher use rates, it's the same product. Uh, we've actually seen some activity out of that on white flies. But on caterpillars, what they're looking at is a much lower use rate combined with a BT. And it's a, it's a, these peptides are very large molecules that won't go through the gut of the insect. So you've got the BT in there to disrupt the gut. The molecule can get into the insect and hopefully kill it. Uh, that's the idea. I haven't been able to make it work, but I'll show you some data in a second. And then we're also working with David Riley's been working with some viruses as well. This is the spear lep work. Uh, as I said, you put the 
you, in, in, we've got a number of things that go on there. If you get too much BT, you impact feeding, they don't consume enough. If you don't have enough, you don't disrupt the gut enough. Uh, if you've got resistance to the BTs, you don't disrupt the gut. And I think that's what's happening in some cases in our fields, uh, but I've not been able to make this work in small plot trials or in bioassays at this point. It's not anything I've given up on. I still have hope for this technology, but, but at this point I haven't been able to make it work. The other one is the baculovirus David Riley's been working with. Uh, this is not new technology by any means, but it is a new strain. The kind of the, the bad part of bacular viruses, two things. One, they're very specific, tend to be more host specific. This particular one is not quite as host specific, uh, but it works on diamondback mole. The other thing is they tend to be slow. I worked with a bacular virus on beet army worms 20 years ago. I got 100% mortality, but I got 100% of that mortality in the pupil stage. So it's just a revenge kill. They've already done all the damage they can do. David worked with this uh, particular bacular virus uh, a couple of years ago, and it was kind of along those lines. They've selected for a more active strain, uh, and they're, they're seeing, as you can see here, mortality at 72 hours. It's not fantastic, but it's probably something that we can utilize along the lines of, of the way we use BTs. BTs don't give you 90% control either. Uh, but this will be a new mode of action. Uh, they're getting better activity out of it. In field trials, uh, if you will, back that up. Initially here, you was also looking at potential combinations of this with BTs. And we've kind of given up on that because there's no additive effect. In field trials, one of the things you're looking at is the back of the virus alone. You see here in this, not great efficacy, but some knockdown of populations here but in combinations with synthetic products. And the ideal is, is these synthetic products where we've got some resistance, give you 60, 70% control, and then the bacula virus gives you a percentage control of what's left. So we're knocking down the population overall. This trial looked particularly a, a, little, a lot better, as you can see here, it got good activity out of the bacula virus alone. Uh, and the combinations, again, show a trend for, for improved efficacy over the synthetics alone. The real interesting thing in this last trial that he did is he went in after the trial was over and checked in all the plots and looked for larvae that showed symptoms of virus impact, a virus infect, infection. The ones where you don't see any virus infection is because he couldn't find any larvae. But if you look in there, he's got some larvae in even the check. In all plots, he found virus-infected larvae, which tells you that that product is, that the virus is replicating in the population and spreading in the field. So that, that's another plus for this virus as far as when we try to figure out exactly how we can use it and what kind of benefit it may give us. Right now, my, my indications are there are, what, 50 liters of the virus in the world and 10 of them in South Georgia? Uh, doing some field work with that now uh, with some growers. Yeah, and, and hopefully this is a product that will be available uh, sometime this year and we can, we can figure out more how to work it into our system. White fly is going to give a talk about that this afternoon, so I'll be pretty brief on that. Nothing's really changed. Uh, for adults, if you're targeting adults, our best products are still PQZ and Savanto Prime. The other neonics will give you some knockdown of adults, but if you really want to knock down the adults, these are your best products. Overall, for just controlling diamondback moth, I mean white flies in general, uh, our, our cornerstone products are still the Group 28, Verimark X-Rail Corrigin, not Harvanta. Harvanta is not a white fly product. And the group four, Savanto Prime, Venom, Acel, Ectara, Platinum, not Admire Pro. Admire Pro has not worked well for us, particularly in the Tifton area, for probably four or five years now. And that's, first of all, don't use Admire Pro, but that should be a warning to you that there's, ne that there's neonicotinoid resistance out there and we need to make sure we, we continue monitoring it and managing it well. Our second tier product, very good products on white flies, they're just not quite as strong as those top tier are NAC and Courier. They're both insect growth regulators, excellent partners in there for rotation. 
And then the third tier are also, they've got good activity. Uh, Safina, PQZ, Movento, Oberon, Torac, I've got a question mark on because I haven't done a lot of work with it on white flies. Looked at a lot on caterpillars, but, it, but it's got white fly activity as well. And really where you can, we need to be working all three of those tiered products into, into your systems. Uh, because if we rely too much on, on one group, particularly those top two groups, we're going to end up with resistance and lose groups. And talk more about that uh, this afternoon also. On pepper weevils, uh, we continue doing the, the overwintering monitoring. Long story short is, yeah, we start with very high populations. They drop down as we go into the spring because they can't live forever without food, but they can live a long time under cold conditions. But the bottom line is that if you look out there at the end, and our ideal situation would be we hit zeros. We don't overwinter, and that's just not happening. We're not overwintering large populations, but we are overwintering pepper weevils consistently. In South Georgia, we've documented that now for, what, four years, I believe. Um, so it's something we're going to have to continue to manage, uh, and it's going to be an annual thing, I believe. Uh, as far as what to, what to spray, Dr. Riley was able to do some bioassays this year with three different weevil species, pepper weevil, uh, sweet potato weevil, and cowpea cuculio. And show you one of those, we'll show you a couple of them later today, uh, tomorrow morning in the pepper session as well. Uh, right now, Vidate's still our best product. Vidate, if you look there, Vidate, uh, Ectara, a sale's not in there, but it would be the pretty much the same as the Acel. Those are, those are our best labeled products. Looking down the road, something would show some hope is the ISM 555, the two bars on the far right, and the broflanolid. That's not going to help with that over there. <laughs> yeah, but there's two screens. Those are both, if you can see, giving us good activity on uh, pepper weevil. Uh, the ISM 555 was registered in Argentina recently. So we have hopes that we'll see it soon, hopefully this year. But getting through uh, EPA is difficult anymore, particularly for an insecticide to blow flannelid. Same thing. We're, they're getting some uh, seed treatment applications, but we really need foliar applications. And I don't think it should, would surprise anybody to know that a broad spectrum insecticide sprayed foliarly will kill honeybees. And that's the big holdup on, on these and getting those foliar applications. So if we get them, there may be some restrictions as to how we can use these products, when we can use them, but we're hoping to get them so that we can work them into our systems for, for weevil management, pepper weevil particularly. Sweet potato weevil is much easier to kill, as you can see here. Um, the ISM 555 broflanol will help us there as well. Vidate working very well, even, even uh, somewhere in their brigade. Uh, the pyrethroids still work fairly well on sweet potato weevil. And then the last one, I hate to end on a sour note, but Calpe Curculio just walks through all this stuff. Even these new products we cannot kill. I do not know of anything legal or illegal that gives us good control of Calpe Curculio. And that's a question I get at every county meeting. And we've looked at all the legal stuff, all the illegal stuff, and uh, we just simply don't control this pest. And with that, I will con uh, finish my talk, and Stanley can decide if I'm on time or not. Any questions? No, this is not my bus. I wish it was. It was in the low. <laughs> it was in the Tifton Lowe's parking lot one day, and I assume the car went with it, but I don't know that either. <laughs> All right. Let's stand this. All right, next we have Dr. Babesh. Here's a clicker. You can at least use the laser on one of the screens. Um, really quick, if you did not get your name badge scan for pesticide credit. We have the scanner here. I also have one up front. 
just make sure you get it before you leave so you can have credit for the meeting. And that's all for now. Dr. Babesh. Thank you, Ty. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be in person after a year. It's really good. I, I don't like Zoom meetings, but I had a Zoom fatigue, but this is very good to be in person and see faces, familiar faces. So thank you. Before I start, uh, I would like to acknowledge Georgia Fruit and Vegetable uh, Association to fund some of this work. I also like to acknowledge uh, our cooperating county extension agents, especially vegetable agents, including Ty and, and others, uh, who helped me in generating some of the data. I also like to acknowledge cooperating uh, vegetable growers, who some of the data has been generated in their fields. So, uh, with that, I'd like to start my fungicide update. Uh, I usually do nearly 25 to 30 trials a year. But today, I'm not going to show you everything. I'm going to show you the major highlights and the important, important features in my trials and some of the important information which is relevant for vegetable growers. All right, those who grow watermelon in South Georgia, they are very familiar with this disease. Fizzerum wilt. It's still a, num a number one watermelon disease in Georgia, but also not in number one in Georgia. It's also in nationwide, wherever watermelon is grown. National Water Association puts this disease, has been putting this disease as a number one priority. Their number one priority since 2015. So it's, it's that bad. Once you get it, you get it. It won't go away. And we don't have enough fields to rotate. So that, so managing this disease is, is very challenging. Well, with respect to fungicides, we all know those who grow watermelon in South Georgia, the only one fungicide which is labeled and has, which has some, level of activity is proline that has to be used at planting one application so what i've been trying to see what else we could do what else we could do without uh, using some other fungicide which are labeled on watermelon most of you know mirvis prime syngenta product it's a very good product on foliar uh, diseases in watermelon and cucurbits too so last two or three years we've been playing with mirvis prime can mirvis prime be used and to see, uh, to assess if it has any kind of activity against Fusarium. But there's a way to use it. This is how we did it. So look at treatment one and treatment two. Treatment one, proline was used once at planting as a salt range. Then we used Mervis Prime twice. First application, 10 days after transplanting, okay? And second application was two weeks after first application. So we had two Mervis Prime application. How did we spray it? We sprayed as a foliar spray with, a high, with at least 60 to 80 gallons of water per acre. So we used a high volume spray. That is to wash the product from the foliage to the ground and at least to the base of the stem. Treatment two, treatment two is, is actually not labeled, uh, but we tried it anyway in our, in our UGA Tifton campus, where we looked at Mervis Prime pre-plant soil drench. So right before transplanting, we had a 10 inch band uh, above those transplant holes. After, after those band, a day later, or uh, six to eight hours later, we transplanted our melon. And then we came back with proline uh, at, at, at plant soil range as usual. But there's one more proline we added after, after a couple of weeks. So, but I just want to make sure that treatment two is, is not a labeled way to do it, but I, we just wanted to assess how Proline will do if we do if we drench it twice, and how Mervis Prime will do if we plant it if we put it before planting. Anyway, grow standard. Grow standard is proline at plant drench. Here's the thing. Look at this one. If if grower don't use pro, oh, holy cow. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. If a grower don't use proline. This is what level of activity, they are, this is what level of infection he will, uh, they will see. In non treated check, we have nearly 66% of physiologic built inf infection. Whereas if we do proline, the infection will reduce. It is a significant reduce from non treated check, but it does something. It was not a great product, but it's the only product which we have labeled. But look at this treatment. When we use proline and supplemented with fuller application of Mervis Prime, although this is not significantly different from the growth standard, but numerically, numerically it was lower. 
So this shows that it, it has some promise. It still has some promise, and this has been consistent. I'm showing you 2021 data, but we have similar data in 2020 and 2019. This this treatment was also uh, uh, has, was also, has also done okay. It's significantly reduced from the non-treated check, but it's not different from the proline or growth standard. So what does it what does this slide show? That Mervis Prime, which is a label product, if you use it in a certain way, it can give a kick. It can give some boost to our already fungicide or to our fungicide program. How to use it? This is what this is what we are recommending to use it. You can use Proline as usual, a 5.7 ounce at plant as a salt range. Uh, yeah, and then come back with Mervis Prime at least a week or 10 days of cup and at most by 14 days. Come back as a fuller application, 60 to 80 gallons, 100 gallons of water. That's it. And you can again spray it after a couple of weeks or three weeks. Now, here's the thing, very important thing. I don't know, I'm sorry about that. Mervis Prime is not allowed to be used or to be injected in soil. It's not for soil use. Okay, it's only for foliar use. Don't use it. Bed spray prior to planting is also not used. Not it's is not recommended. Uh, not recommended as well as it's not allowed. So Mervis Prime soil use is not allowed. You can use it in the foliar using a high volume spray. All right. Next disease in in not only in watermelon but also in the entire cucurbit, anthracnose. Anthracnose, we've been controlling anthracnose since 2008, and it was not a big deal to control this disease until 2017, 2018, maybe early 2019. Since mid-2019, it has become a problem, and it's a serious problem now, since 2019 to 2021. Uh, those who are familiar with anthracnose symptoms, you can see this foliar symptoms, as well as the fruit symptoms, okay? The fruit symptoms is much more problematic. So the, uh, if, a, if a infected, one infected fruit is present in a bin with a bunch of other infected fruits, it will infect all the fruits in the bin. So that will result in rejection of your load. What is the current scenario of cucurbit anthracnose? So I'm talking about not watermelon anthracnose, I'm talking about cucurbit altogether. So there was a recent, uh, we did some uh, preliminary survey in Georgia in different cucurbit fields, where, wherever we had this anthracnose epidemic, we found that the, the growers who used, who relied on group 11s, especially quarters, had loss of efficacy. Seems to, uh, s seems to lose the efficacy against this uh, disease. And then uh, we also found, it's not here, but we also collected some of the isolates from different fields and we tested in the, in, in the lab and we found nearly 40 to 50 percent of the isolates we collected were already resistant to quadris, or actually azoxytrobin. Uh, but they have, they are still sensitive to paraclostrobin, but majority of the isolates, nearly 40 to 50 percent, were resistant. So this shows there is a there is a potential resistance development to quadris, or especially QOIs, in in cucurbit anthracnose. So. What we should do? There was a fungicide efficacy trial done in 2021, where we looked at a bunch of different products. Actually, we started in 2020. We looked at a bunch of different label products against anthracnose, and we came up top hitters. Topsin, Proline, Inspire Super were the top hitters. Top uh, that performed very well against the anthracnose. Now, in 2021, what we did, we tried to include microthiol sulfur. Okay. So there is an observation which made by Dr. Albert Kalbreth, uh, our peanut pathologist. What he found that uh, adding macrothyl sulfur with group threes and group 11s actually gives a kick, even in situation where the group 11 resistance development in peanut leaf, uh, leaf spots, this addition of macrothyl sulfur actually helps in the, in the, in the management of a, a leaf spot. So with the same premise, I try to see if some of the top products which I found in 2020 to be effective against anthracnose, will addition of our tank mixing microthyl sulfur will give a kick or not. So you can see here, we, I had quadris, quadris microthyl sulfur, topsin, topsin with microthyl sulfur, 
proline, proline with mycothal sulfur, inspired super, inspired super with mycothal sulfur. All right, top products, topsin, and it mixes, and others performed well, significantly better than the non-treated check. Quadris did not. Quadris with mycothal sulfur did not. So this shows that there's a field insensitivity to quadris. That's what we, we thought of to begin with. But second question, did microthal sulfur kick, give a kick to some of the top fungicides? No, not to all, and specific. With top stain and inspired super, it did not. But with proline, it did, you see? With proline, uh, this is proline alone, and this is proline with microthal sulfur. It was the proline with microthal sulfur had a significantly lower disease, AODPC value, compared to the proline itself. So it seems there is a, this interaction with microthal sulfur with some of the specific fungicides is specific. We still have to understand and we still have to assess its consistency in uh, other field trials. But this is something exciting. All right, as I mentioned that uh, I've been doing these field trials, uh, looking at the efficacy of individual fungicides, I was able to rank these fungicides. So this is what we found, that proline and topsin are highly to moderately effective against anthracnose. Luna experience, Marivon, Marivis Prime, Aprovia top, moderately effective. Bravo and Cabrio, not much, it's less effective. Manzate, Quadris, Pyrazoflumid, not effective at all. So, moving on, our another nemesis in uh, watermelon production, Phytophthora capsici, or Phytophthora fruit rot. I usually do Phytophthora fruit rot evaluation in growers field, who, the growers who had, a, uh, who had this Phytophthora endemic in their field, and I choose the worst spot to do, do this work. So this trial was done in conjunction with uh, our county extension agent from Brooks County, Mihasha Dowdy. She did an excellent job in uh, do, doing this trial with me and assessing the fruit rot after, uh, after this trial. So this trial is a little unique in sense most of our watermelon growers spray for Phytophthora after fruit set. Right after fruit set, they'll start spraying. So we asked two questions. Can we initiate our spray right at vine run and get, and get um, a more efficacy uh, compared to up when, when the fungicides are applied, same fungicides applied at fruit set. The second question we asked, can we mix phosphites, especially kephite, with some of the label products, top level products in Phytophthora, and can get a kick? Okay, now this, now here's the thing, this is a grower, grower field, I cannot have an untreated check. So you will not, you will not see an untreated check here. But what you will see here, uh, the comparison of three different treatments. Okay, first treatment applied at vine run. We started with Presidio, or on this ultra and Illumin in rotation, and every time when we use this fungicide, we tank mix with K5, four parts. Right. This program again was initiated at vine run. Program two, it is different. We started with first two sprays with K5 followed by Presidio and Illumin rotation, and then we added this uh, k as a tank mix to this, with these fungicides. Program three, initiated at fruit set, started with Presidio, Orandis, and Illumin in rotation, and it's more likely as a grower standard, and uh, we did not add k here. As I, what were our two questions first? Did application of this fungicide make any difference at vine run? No. You will get a similar, similar level of efficacy if you apply at vine run or fruit set against Phytophthora. What was our second question? Did K5 give a kick? More likely, yes. Sometimes, no. In this, this year, it did not. But in previous years, it did. So shall we include K5 or phosphites in our in our spray, yes, I would definitely. Phosphates are very good product against oomycetes, and if you tank mix them with these uh, with these uh, product, you will definitely get a kick. 
In this trial, it did not, but I have data from other trials where it did. So I would still recommend using these fungicides at fruit set and use phosphides. All right, moving gears to from cucurbits to pepper. Anthracnose is, is also becoming a problem in pepper. But pepper anthracnose is completely different from cucurbit anthracnose caused by different species of clototricum. So those who, who, who are familiar with uh, uh, anthracnose in bell pepper, this is a typical symptom you will see. Big round concentric spots. There are two types of anthracnose. One is primary anthracnose, which is, in, which is caused by a highly aggressive clototricum. And the secondary anthracnose, where, uh, where uh, anthracnose will follow after sun scalding. Okay, this trial, we conducted two different trials of anthracnose, one with bell peppers, another with jalapeno peppers. So this trial was conducted in Grady County in, uh, with the help of Kale and Thai. And these are the products we looked at. Mer Top Guard, Mervis Prime, Switch, Inspire, Super, Quadris, Approvia Top, and Bravo. Uh, good, good news, Quadris is still working. Approvia Top and Bravo, these three are the, our moderately effective product. The other product that uh, popped up was Switch. Inspire Super and Top Guard EQ did not do much. Sorry, no, Top Guard. It was as good as non treated check. So we have at least these three product, three to four products which are working. Another trial, Alpino Paper. So this trial was done in Tifton, where we looked at the similar product, same product, different results, but more likely uh, the only difference was switch. If you remember, switch did have efficacy against bell pepper on thracnose in Grady County, but in Tiff County, it did not. It was as good as non treated check. And what we are talking here is person fruit rot. But the one, the, the, here is the consistency Quadris, Approvia Top, and Bravo still worked. Look at the level of significant reduction of, uh, uh, of uh, fruit rot percentage compared to non treated check. Among these three, look at Approvia Top. It was the best product in my trial. It reduced the fruit rot incidence from nearly 80% to 15%. All right, uh, moving along, Southern Blight. I looked at a bunch of different products in, against Southern Blight, uh, caused by the Sclerotium Ralsei. I also looked at Rhyme. Rhyme has been picking heat. Uh, and I also looked at how best we can use Rhyme. And, uh, and, and so forth. So rhyme, which is a 22.7% flu triathol. It is, it's frac group three. Top guard is 11.7% uh, flu triathol. It's again uh, frac three. These two products have efficacy. Against, these two products have efficacy against uh, southern blight. We looked at rhyme, five ounce rate, drench, rhyme, seven ounce rate, drench. Seven ounce range, uh, seven ounce range, drench was uh, had a highly significant activity against Southern Blight compared to five ounce range. Rhyme seven ounce drip versus director spray, not much difference between them, but they were, they were quite, they are significantly better compared to non treated check. Top Guard EQ, directed spray, significantly better than non treated check and, and Rhyme five ounce rate. Quadris, excellent. Quadris directed spray. 2.6 uh, means uh, significantly reduced southern blight, uh, southern blight incidence. Fantelis, which has been a mainstay of for our growers against this disease, it also has it's, it's also still active. Pyrazoflumid, it's a new uh, group seven product, still to be bit, still to get labeled on tomatoes, but it still ha it has very good activity. More or less, we have good news against southern blight. We have a bunch of different products. The only thing is that you have to use it in a certain way to get activity. Powdery mildew. So last three, two or three years I've been talking about different new products in powdery mildew. You might have seen Garden been working great. Vivendo been great, working great. So, and Quintech is okay. So most of our growers rotate with Vivendo and Garden, and it does okay. There's a new product. 
It's called Pro Levo. It is a le it's a new it's a novel frac. It's frac fifty. It's it got a level in cucurbits. Okay, it is also effective. It is not as effective as Gatton and uh, Pro Levo. Uh, sorry, Gatton Vivando, but it's up there. It's far better than Quintec. So, but this is just based on one year of ass assessment. It needs further assessments, but one year of assessment looks promising. But our growers, if they want to, because since this is label product, you can, you can think of rotating this product with Gatton and Vivando. Now for our organic growers, Serenade also brings something to the game. Okay, Serenade is organic product. Look, Serenade is far better compared to non tutor check. So it's not great product, but it does have some activity against powdery. Downy. So this is based on 2021 uh, uh, trial. These are the single. These are the products, single applications, and here is here is the level of disease, and you can see the differences among their activity. So moderately effect, effective products, Illumin and Randman, but numerically Illumin was far better than Randman, and uh, also uh, statistically. Uh, Pericor Flex. Bravo, Arondis, still working, great products. Rotation, rotating with these chemistries with uh, Bravo will help in, in, uh, in, in managing this disease. I'm not too worried about Downy, there are a bunch of other products, they're still effective. The things which we have to uh, worry about is Curset, which used to work till 2018, it's lost its efficacy, it's, it's not a great product anymore now. Alternaria in, bro in brassicas, especially in broccoli. Alternaria uh, in, in brassicas is not a problem, not only a problem in Georgia, but a problem everywhere, especially in the East, for the East Coast broccoli growers. And I was talking to our, my friend from California, they also had this, this, this issue is pretty bad there too. Those who know about Alternaria in broccoli, they are very familiar with the symptoms. It can, you can have big concentric spot on the foliage, as the disease progresses, you will see big shot holes. Sometimes the pathogen can go from foliage to, to the head and can make the head unmarketable. You know, uh, for marketing, uh, uh, means a grower cannot tolerate a single spot on the head, as any single spot on the head. So look at this head, how bad it is. Okay, look at conventional products. There are a bunch of conventional products which are used. The one which are not working, Quadris, Quadris top. This is the first time switch did not work. Things, the products that are working, Bravo, Endura, Fontelis, Inspire Super, Mervis Prime, Luna Sensation, Preoxor, Top God. One in common trend you will find among these products, most of the products have group sevens or group sevens as premixes. They're all working. Even group threes are also working. So uh, the user recommendation is follow this product. Follow, you, can, uh, you can use these fungicides, but use in a mindful way because some of this product has a bunch of uh, group sevens. So you have to be mindful in rotating with group sevens with group threes and, and uh, multi-site mode of action chemistries. So, Please contact County Extension Agent or me through them. We can help you out with this with, with a good financial recommendation against this disease. For our for our organic growers, what are the options? It's a big problem in organic. It's much worse in organic than in conventional. The thing that worked out, marcothal sulfur. Marcothal sulfur it was was the one somehow I included in my trial. It did great. It had a significantly less Head rot compared to non treated check. OSO did okay. Lifeguard did okay. Uh, double nickel, not too great. Sorry. Uh, Nordox and OSO did okay. Uh, Lifeguard did not do well. Double nickel did okay. Regalia is uh, not too great. Uh, then I had two conventional products as a check. You cannot, conventional products cannot be, these products cannot compete with the conventional products. But look at Marcothal Sulfur. It was very good, as good as a conventional, not even significantly different from the conventional products. So for our organic growers, what they should think of, 
using OSO, you may think of Mercatol Sulfur also, although this is only one year of assessment with Mercatol Sulfur, but OSO we had a couple of years of data. So we cannot complete a FinSET update without onions. <laughs> All right, what else in onion? What's going on with Botrytis? So these are the products we had look, I looked at, individual products. Uh, Roverol, Scala, Luna Tranquility, Omega, Mervis Prime, Merivon, and there's experimental product here. The red thing, everything worked except Scala. Scala used to work until 2019. It stopped working since 2020 and 2021. Both the years, Scala stopped working. It's a group nine from this side. So that's something the grower can think of. Okay, Sevia. Sevia is a novel frac 3 fungicide that has a promise in, in, uh, in uh, botrytis leaf blight management. This year I looked at four different programs with, uh, with and without Sevia, where you had Luna Tranquility with Sevia in rotation, Luna with Inspire Super in rotation, which is a growth standard, Merivon and Sevia in rotation, and Merivon Inspire Super, this is another growth standard. We found that there's uh, no, th this uh, Sevia with Luna Tranquility or, or Merivon uh, was able to reduce the disease as good as these growth standards. So CBS has a promise. And we will be again evaluating this product this year. So ranking based on three or four years of my trial, this is how we ranked different fungicides against uh, against botrytis. So we have Omega, Mervis Prime, High to Moderate, Luna Tranquility, Inspired Super, Fantelis, and Marivan Moderate. Moderate to low, we have a bunch of fungicides with moderate to low. Switch, we have still put a moderate to low because in some cases it may work, but uh, it's still, uh, we still have to do more assessment to see if it has really lost its efficacy or not. So, uh, Scala, uh, not efficacious anymore. Uh, Stemphilium ranking, this is based on three years of trial. This is how we ranked. Stem Omega doesn't work on Stemphilium. So just be aware, you can rely, you have to rely on Ruler Tranquility, Inspire Super, Mervis Prime, Quadristop does have some activity, and so forth. Omega and Scala, no, no efficacy against stem failure. So I think I have overboard you with the, all the fungicides, the fungicides name and the efficacy, but if I have any, if you guys have any question, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. No questions? No. What was the gr uh, group? Was it Sevia? Group, group 3. Group 3. Uh, which group Sevia belongs to? It's group 3 from this side. It's Abraham Fulmer's product. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you don't have any questions, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Babesh. Really quick, everybody don't forget to um, scan your name badges if you would like credit for this session. And also, um, before Dr. Culpepper gets started, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ted McAvoy. He's gonna be our new, uh, or he's our new uh, vegetable horticulturalist. And we're glad to have him. He came to us from industry and we're looking forward to all the work he's gonna do with us. Next. We have Dr. Stanley Culpepper give us a um, herbicide update. All right, good morning, everybody. Everybody hear me okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm going to give you an update, but before I begin, I want to, those of you that came in late, right now the EPA is supposed to be talking to us. Unfortunately, I think everybody's well aware of the COVID situation. And the restrictions on federal employees out of the Washington, D.C. area are quite complex. So we were unable to have those speakers join us. Um, they are amazing people. We had two of the best of the best that you could get. But hopefully this summer we can get them to come join us and we'll come visit some of you guys on your farms. And that may give them a, a better opportunity to see firsthand at what you're doing. The second thing I want to do, I've been coming to this meeting a long time. And I have never been brought any of my employees or my team that helps me. I've got two of them here today. They're over here in the corner. Uh, one is Miss Jenna Vance, and the other is Miss Taylor Randall. Taylor actually talked to you this afternoon in the mulch plastic culture section. 
Uh, but I could not bring you this information without these guys. Now, with that said, I'm going to give you an update on a, a bunch of new cool things that I think are happening with herbicides. And then I'm going to take just a few minutes to, to talk about some different subject areas that I think are important to you. Hopefully somewhere within this presentation we can help you and your farm remain sustainable. Now for the last few years we talked a lot about the residual activity of Roundup, right? Three or four years ago nobody even thought about Roundup as having residual activity, right? So we've done a tremendous amount of work. I think we finished that work and this is probably the last time I'm really going to spend much time talking about that. Uh, just to remind you what we've talked about over the last couple of years, this is one of Taylor's slides from some of her graduate research. If you look on the left, uh, that is a transplant cucumber where no glyphosate was applied pre-plant, again pre-plant, no foliar contact, uh, versus applications of glyphosate applied pre-plant seven days, four days, or one day prior to transplanting. So again, the theory that glyphosate does not have residual activity is simply not true in the world that we live in, especially in transplant production. All right, I'm going to give you a summary on glyphosate in just a minute, but what I'm able to do is I'm able to summarize glyphosate at the same time I do glufosinate. Glufosinate is the active ingredient of what we're going to call RELI, which is similar to our cotton and agronomic use of Liberty. All right, we are expecting and hopeful and very hopeful that a label will happen in 2022 with that, this active ingredient for you guys, especially in fruiting vegetables and cucurbits. All right, it may not happen for the spring crop, but hopefully by the fall crop we'll have you a label. The label will include pre-plant bare ground applications, pre-plant over mulch, I'm going to talk about how you do this in just a minute, row middle applications, and we'll be able to make up to three applications as long as we don't exceed a total of 87 fluid ounces. Now, I do not know if the label is going to be a Reli label or a Liberty label. Uh, maybe it'll be both. I don't know. We'll have to sit and wait and see what our friends at BASF decide to do with this product. So, let's right off the bat help you understand the residual activity out of Reli is greater than that on glyph than glyphosate on some crops, but then on some other crops, glyphosate has a greater residual impact than RELI. So you have to be very, very careful. And this again is a picture. If you look at the top left, that's no RELI applied pre-transplant. If you look at the bottom right, that is RELI applied pre-transplant, not following the label that we're developing for you guys to implement on your farm. So when you think about the factors that are influencing the residual activity out of the Roundup or the residual activity out of the Liberty slash Reli, there are a lot of complex factors influencing the result. Soil type is absolutely critical. Uh, if we're on my family farm up in northeastern North Carolina with heavy soils, I will never see that activity occur. All right, so lighter, sandy, low organic matter soils make these herbicides more active. Production is critical, seeded versus transplants. We have to be careful with seeded, but seeded really isn't the problem. It's transplant into land that's been treated with these products. Rate is absolutely essential. That's why you will see in our recommendations some limited rates. Irrigation can influence how much of these products are still there at planting. And then interval after application and before planting is important, as well as crop sensitivity. All right, we're not going to have a problem in cotton. We're not going to have a problem in peanuts. We're not going to have a problem in wheat or small grains. But in some of these produce crops, they're quite sensitive to the residual activity. So to try to summarize what we're going to bring to you, uh, we have the Roundup label now in. Uh, it, is, it is accepted. It is approved. And again, hopefully the Liberty label is going to come and look like this in, in mid-summer. If we're looking at pre-plant bare ground transplants, that's the application method. That is the most sensitive or most vulnerable production method to get damage. If we use 32 ounces of Roundup Power Max, and I'm just going to take Roundup Power Max and I'm going to take Liberty, you can get the equivalent. If we go with 32 ounces of Roundup Power Max, we would need to wait seven days, and then we would have to have an irrigation or a rainfall event of at least a half an inch between that application and planting. For Liberty, it's going to be 14 days because, again, a lot of the crops that we use this tool for would be a little larger. I will show you the importance of irrigation. Again, one of Taylor's study. If you look on the left, that's an application of Reli, no irrigation, transplanted. 
on the right, everything's happening at the same time. The only difference is an irrigation occurred between application and transplanting. So it is a big deal and we, when we write this label and you get this label, uh, it is based off sound science. We are not just trying to, to be very difficult for you to implement a new tool that is going to be very important for you. The next method I've highlighted in yellow, a little less challenging but still a challenge, is pre-plant over mulch, right, before we're transplanting second crop, third crop, etc. For Roundup, if we go with 32 ounces, we need three days, and yes, you must have an irrigation or rainfall of a half an inch. We can go up to 64 ounces, but we need 10 days plus that rainfall. All right, with Liberty, it's going to be 32 ounces, hopefully. Again, the label may be slightly different than what I'm sharing with you today, but we should be really, really close. It'll be three days, and again, you have to wash the Liberty off the plastic. Now, again, this afternoon, we're going to talk about a lot of cool data that we generated with herbicides and how they interact with plastic. A lot of that data you've never seen before because today will be the first time we present it. But just to drive home the point, here's an example. On the left is an excessively high rate of relay that's not labeled you would never want to use, you couldn't afford to use. We washed the product off, we have no problem. On the right, if you don't wash it off, uh, the outcome is quite often variable, but it's not a positive result. Also, think about on plastic culture. Again, we'll hit this hard this afternoon. If you're in second crop or third crop and you already have a whole present, I just told you about Rely and, and Roundup having residual activity. If they run into that plant hole and you end up putting a plant in that old plant hole, you could get residual damage. This gives you an idea of residual damage from a high concentration of glyphosate or Roundup in the plant hole because remember it's not a 1x rate in that plant hole because you washed the mulch so now we have a higher rate in the plant hole. Again something that we will uh, describe and define more this afternoon. The last two application methods are, are more simplistic and, and probably pretty simple to adopt. Row middle applications you can go up to 64 ounces of, of Roundup with Liberty, it's going to be the same thing. You don't have to worry about irrigation. You just simply have to keep it off the crop, which you already know. Pre-plant seeded, we can use Roundup and Rely applied prior to seeding. Most of you do tillage, but if we want to use those guys, we can. We need three days for Roundup. We need seven days for Rely, and we have to irrigate between the application and the planting to avoid that. If you're not familiar with Rely or Liberty, it is absolutely outstanding on one of our most problematic weeds, and that would be our Morning Glory species. It's also very good on a lot of other weeds, but Morning Glory is something that we certainly could use new tools to help us with. All right, let me give you an update with Chateau. We actually got this label last year, but since we didn't get a chance to get together, uh, I want to make sure you're aware it's out there because I think this is a really big deal. Um, this is the label for the dry Chateau, hopefully in early... 2022, make sure I get my year right, we're going to have the liquid formulation of Chateau. All right, so we're expecting that label coming along. This label is a row middle application. It is a phenomenal impactful tool, but you must know what you're doing or you can really harm yourself greatly. It's got a lot of fruiting vegetables, a lot of cucurbits, and we've even got the brassica head and stem vegetables added to this row middle label. Now again, I want to expand on it just a little bit because this, if you're going to mess something up, this may be one of those that, that challenges you. You've got to follow the right steps. If you do that, this is a wonderful tool. You've got to be in plastic culture raised beds at least four inches and at least 25 inches wide. The label that we got that's different, we've had a Chateau label for over a decade. This label lets you go up to the equivalent of eight ounces per acre broadcast. Now let me stress to you, that does not mean you should use eight ounces. That does not mean you need eight ounces. All right, most of you do not, and I'll prove that to you in a minute. We're simply building a label trying to uh, allow flexibility for you. You've got to spray before you plant. You can't get it more than one inch up the side of the plastic. You do not want it to get on top of the plastic. We cannot wash it off effectively. Uh, we still need a rain of at least a quarter inch on that row metal application to make sure sand and other environmental conditions don't make that herbicide move from the row metal onto your plants once you transplant or once you plant. So you've got to follow those steps. If you follow those steps, it's bulletproof and it's one of the most impactful tools you can use. Here I'll show you an idea. i got a lot of arrows and a, and a lot of uh, different things to talk about on this slide, but this one's really neat. We're, we're doing this actually right now. 
If you look at the red arrow, that's a six foot non-treated part that I left of the field. So no Roundup, no Chateau. If you look at the blue, and I'll try to use this pointer. I can't see that. If, if you look down at the blue line, or blue arrow, you can see that had Roundup plus Valor, and it goes up about 50 to 60 feet. All right, now this was applied in October. All right, so you can see where I stopped because our residual activity is given out. We've had like eight inches of rain now, right? So my residual activity out of two ounces of Valor is gone. However, if you look at the rest of the field, I use five ounces of Valor. So there is a huge difference between two and four or five ounces of Valor, or sorry, Chateau, if you put it in your row middle. Chateau and Valor are the same active ingredient, but Chateau is the one that we had labeled for you. All right, so it's a good tool. Figure out how to use it, but don't go out and just put eight ounces because you probably don't need it and you're wasting your money. One thing that's challenging us with Chateau is we know you want to have cover crops in your first crop, right? There's no doubt in your row middles. Chateau will kill ryegrass dead as dead, right? It'll also cause significant damage to other cover crops. So we're working to try to figure out how can we let your cover crop get established enough that then we can come in with the Chateau to prevent the purslane and all these other weeds from coming up. So we're still working on that right now. We don't have that. Second crop, third crop mulch where you don't have a cover crop, it's a valuable tool. But first crop, we're trying to figure out how to let you get that cover in that road middle, then get the herbicide out to prevent all the other weeds from coming up later. All right, let me give you an update on Prowl and, and Satellite Hydrocap. The active ingredient on these two herbicides is pendimethalin. Um, we got some really cool additional labels. Again, just more tools for your toolbox. The difference between trifluralin or treflan and this product is this product will generally sit on the ground a couple of extra days waiting for rainfall for activation. So you guys in plaster culture, uh, you may not have the ability to irrigate the herbicide in and this tool could be very beneficial. But we do have row middle applications now for broccoli, Brussels sprout, sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, cantaloupe, watermelon, muskmelon, eggplant, pepper, and tomato, and we go up to two pints per acre, we just simply don't want to contact the crop. Pretty simple process, you would add it in with a row middle application. I'll also mention we have a prowl label now for green onions. We've never had one for green onions. We've had one for dry bulb, but never for green onions. So pretty simple tool. We use it just like we use it in, in the other onions. Satellite Hydrocap also has a label that allows you to spray over brassica greens. But our data says this is a bad idea. So we're not going to add this in any in of our information. But what I do like is you could use it in your row middles. So again, a row middle application is where I would encourage you to go with this. We're not going to add this uh, into our book because I have had problems with my brassicas actually breaking off after an application of pendimethalin over the top when you get a heavy wind. Uh, it swells right there at the, at the root base uh, and it's something that you don't want to deal with. So I'd encourage you not to do that. And that's another perfect example, just because a product is labeled somewhere does not mean it fits for you the way we produce these different produce crops. Hopefully this week, maybe next week, I've been talking about this for two years, things move slow, but hopefully in the next two weeks we will actually get two new reflex labels. One is going to be for eggplant. Here's some data. If you look along the x-axis, we've got reflex rates. If you look along the y-axis, you've got your percent injury. We're, we're in pretty good shape, we think. Now, we're going to bring the label up to 12 ounces. You can use it in plastic culture or you can use it in bare ground. It is a tool. You'll need to watch your carryover if you put it under plastic because it will last a significant amount of time. We also should, in the next two to three weeks, um, oops, sorry, just to, to, there's the 12 ounces. Also, we should have a label for sweet potato. Um, now, the sweet potato use label is going to look very similar to your Valor label. We would use it the same process. We would prepare the land, land put the herbicide out, irrigate and transplant. Now, I do not see reflex as being a major game changer in sweet potato. It does not replace Valor at all. But what it does do is it could bring you some yellow nut sedge suppression that we can't get with any other tool in sweet potato production. All right, so nice tool, will not change the game, but it'll be available um, for you hopefully in the next two to three weeks. All right, let me talk just a minute about a new one that you've never heard us talk about. It's called Bicyclopyrone. All right, this is a new one that's being developed by Syngenta for watermelon. 
We've been working on it for the last five or six years, and we focused our effort on crop tolerance. You know, when I work with herbicides and produce, it is all about crop tolerance. When I work in cotton, it's about weed control and crop tolerance, but that, that's just not the way it is with the produce world. All right, so this product looks pretty good, and we believe we have figured out how to, to use this very effectively in our watermelon production system. Now, this is not going to happen until at least this fall, so we get a whole nother year before you can get this product. You can't go out and just buy this product. Bicyclopyrone is a tank mix partner in many products that are commercialized, but it is not currently available by itself. All right, so we're going to be able to use it both in, in uh, bare ground and in plastic culture. Uh, we will have specific use patterns and, and specific um, application methods. Now, one thing that I have not done, I have not spent a lot of time working on weed response. We're going to do that this year, but I borrowed this slide from Syngenta. And if you look at the table over on the right, they give pluses or minuses based on where it would help us with weed control. Palmer amaranth, they see a, a huge positive. You see it has nothing on nuts edge, right? It's not going to bring you anything for nuts edge, but pigweed uh, for, for um, water, some of the amaranth species, but look down at number nine. Number nine is the one that I really want to get help on. Now, the data, the preliminary data I've done is suppression. It's not control maybe 50 to 60 percent for two to three weeks, but we need to repeat that data. But I'm hoping it'll help us on our amaranthus species like our pigweeds and then also uh, help us some on our morning glory. Now again, registration may happen summer or the fall of this year. We feel good about using it in watermelon today as far as crop tolerance. What we need a lot of information on is we need more data on weed response and how it fits in our current system, which is pretty good, and then carryover. We have a huge challenge with carryover. It will absolutely limit its adoption early on while we're generating data to determine if the crops we like to rotate fit well in this system. So all these new labels, it's really amazing with herbicides because herbicides are complicated to get labeled in the produce world. It takes a lot of cooperative efforts. Our forage critical, farmers are crit critical, Department of Agriculture. Uh, all of this is, is essential for us. And as Ty said earlier, support from the Vegetable Co Commodity Commission is absolutely essential to generate this data. All right, so I'm going to switch subjects and talk to you just a few, few more minutes about different topics that I think are important for you to think about. There are problems that we're seeing or problems that are on the horizon that you need to be aware of that's going on in the world of agriculture. Let me first talk to you just a second about deep turning. Uh, a lot of you might deep turn for many different reasons, but if you have purslane problems, you have small seeded broadleaf, amaranth pigweed problems, any of those small seeded broadleaf or grass weeds, deep turning, if you haven't done so in the last three to four years, can help you out tremendously. It's interesting to understand, depending on where a given seed is in the soil profile, that will greatly influence whether or not that plant or that seed can germinate and become a plant that is problematic for you. This is an interesting bar graph that we generated with Palmer Amaranth. We did all this work obviously in cotton. But you're looking at percent emergence along the y-axis and on the x-axis you're looking at depth of burial. On this pigweed, if you look at a half inch or one inch, you see tremendous amount of emergence. However, at four inches, basically this seed cannot germinate. So if you have a plant or a weed that is killing you, the first step to success is understanding the biology of that plant. Right? It's not, hey, what do I go spray to control this or that? It's how do I understand this plant and what can I do to mitigate the plant from being in the field? If, the, if it doesn't come up, we don't have to kill it. All right, this is the same process that's going to occur with purslane. Here's an example with pigweed. No herbicides whatsoever on your left is no deep tillage. On your right is deep tillage. Right? That's a cotton, obviously a cotton crop. But. It also works for ryegrass. This is a concept study. Ryegrass is, a, is, is on the verge of putting some of our small grain producers out of business. It's resistant to every class of herbicide chemistry that's ever created or ever will be created. We have fields we can't farm in. On the left was planted at the same time as on the right. A great uh, scientist, Dr. Ted Webster, went in and just deep turned that ryegrass to show you the concept of where that seed is will influence what kind of germination that can occur. He reduced germination over 95% by placing that seed down. Now again, this is a concept study because they're not seed throughout the soil profile. He put all the seed in the top inch or so, right? But it proves to you as well as to the rest of us, 
if we understand where the seed can germinate, we can better manage its uh, control. Now, of course, the exception is nutsedge, because nutsedge will, will basically germinate from China and come up. All right, let's talk just a minute about grasses. This is one of the areas I see our growers missing out on a great, the great opportunity to provide control. All right, so we have tools in all of our broadleaf crops to control grasses effectively, at least in the state of Georgia. There is resistance, a lot of different grass resistances in the Mid-South, and it's something we need to be concerned of, but at least right now we don't have that confirmed. We have many different formulations. Clethenem is one of the most common. I'm showing you the difference here, and I've showed you the slide before, but I keep getting the question nonstop. What's the difference between the old clethidium formulations like Select versus a product like Select Max? This is an example of large crabgrass control. If you look on the left, that is Select, the old traditional two-pound material without an adjuvant. You do not get control without an adjuvant. In fact, you have to add a crop oil. All right, and then you have a fit because the crop oil burns your cucumber or burns your tomato or burns your squash, so then you don't want to do it, or you reduce the rate. And when you reduce the rate, or you don't put the adjuvant, what you're doing is you are creating resistance to that chemistry. All right, long term, that is a problem for you and everyone else. If you add the surfactant in, you see the second bar, we're much more effective. We're at 75%. Crop oil is what you have to have if you want to truly be effective with those traditional older products, period. All right, with Select Max, we've got a little more flexibility. If we are timely, we do not have to add an adjuvant. If we don't add an adjuvant, we reduce the potential to get injury. You can see we had 97 and 99% control with Select Max. We were timely. The problem is many of you are not timely with grasses. You're spraying eight to 10 inch grasses. You need to be spraying most of the time within three weeks of planting. Assuming you planted clean, you need to be out there within 17 to 21 days because your grasses are gonna be about three inches tall. All right, we already know it. We know what the grass is gonna do. We know when it's gonna be there. You got a lot going on, but when you get later, you get less control. Grasses are extremely competitive, way more competitive than you think, more competitive than most broadleaves, and you need to take them out. And the one that deserves special recognition, goose grass, is a nightmare. You do not want goose grass. If you have it, you want to identify it very early in establishment, and you need to take it out, even if you need to go to a different crop. It's going to get resistance faster than any other uh, grass that we've got. It's already the most difficult grass to control, both with the grass herbicides and also with Roundup. There is Roundup resistant goose grass in a large area in the Mid-South. We probably have it. We just haven't had the time to, to look for it and uh, identify it. So you do have a select max label for a ton of crops where you can go in there without an adjuvant, you still may get a little injury, but I promise you, you'll get less injury, but you've gotta be timely if you wanna provide control. If you want minimal injury, the best control, and the product to keep working, you need to get in there early to take these grasses out. All right, let me talk about purslane for a minute or two. Most of you know exactly what purslane is, it's extremely problematic. It's extremely problematic because your management program isn't designed to control this plant. You have to understand, if you want to control this plant, it is all about residual activity. Now, you guys grow a ton of different crops, so I just listed some of the products that are effective residual-wise. Not post-emergence-wise, not after it's up, but before it ever comes up. Look at all the options that we've got. Now, what you want to do is you want to pick, if you have the option, depending on the crop you're growing, you want to take two of these products and you want to put them together. So, for example, one of my favorite is I'll take Treflan. I'll actually use a little lower rate than I would if I was Treflan alone, maybe 12 to 14 ounces. Then I'll take Dual, 12 ounces. I can put 12 ounces of Treflan, 12 ounces of Dual. I can get better weed control. I'll get less injury than you ever will with a pint and a half of Treflan or a pint of Dual, right? So learning how to implement that is important. The other thing you have to remember, you get four inches of rain, your residual is gone. You need to come back in and put some more residual in before the purslane comes up. Because once it comes up in most of our crops, ain't going to happen. We ain't going to control it. Even after your crop is done, you know how hard it is to control this, so you have to prevent it from coming up. Probably the best method 
to clean up after the crop is over would be a Roundup followed by Gramoxone. Roundup alone is not going to do it. You know it. Gramoxone alone is not going to do it. Even when we get Reli in there, it's not going to do it. Okay? So you're going to have to, to implement the program to prevent this from getting established. And I'm going to tell you, for most of you, the row middles and plastic culture is where this weed is killing you and it gets established. It produces so many seed that you're then facing a tremendous challenge. I'll remind you, a lot of you guys like to put Trefland out and then irrigate it in. It's not labeled. That's your decision. But I, on the left is that method versus on the right is where I incorporate Trefland in one to two inches. All right. I just want to make sure you understand what is happening with that application procedure. You've got a lot of decisions you have to make. Two other subjects, and then I'm going to shut up. This one is a big deal to Georgia. It may not be as big a deal to you guys because you're quite diversified. But we are defining, and Taylor, this is some of Taylor's work, we are finding our Palmer amaranth or our pigweed species resistant to PPO herbicides. All the pictures of labels that I have on the slide are PPO herbicides. So if we get resistance to one, we may get resistance to them all. Your produce growers, but I'm guessing Valor or Valor slash Chateau, Reflex, Gold, these products are important to, in some of the crops that you grow. Here's an example of some of her work on the left is a non-treated. If you look at Cobra, Blazer, or Reflex, at tremendous rates, you will not kill this pigweed. So we won't go into your beans with Reflex and kill this pigweed. It will not happen. All right? What is more alarming is we are losing the residual activity out of these herbicides. They are the most important backbone to a cotton or a peanut program, but they're also important to you. If you look on the left, that's a non-treated control. You can see the pigweed that have come up. If you look in the middle, that is how that pigweed should respond to valor, residual-wise. If you look on the right, that is how these populations are responding. All right, so this is a great concern. Many of you swap land with agronomic producers. Many of you are agronomic producers, so you need to be aware this could influence your system. We don't know exactly yet how, what the level of resistance is, but the bottom line is you will not control these plants in the field with PPO herbicides, period. Last subject I'm going to mention, and I really wanted my, my buddies from the EPA to discuss this with you, but obviously they couldn't be here, so I wanted to, to mention this to you. Pesticide drift is very serious, and it will influence our sustainability as much as just about anything that's happening in agriculture. We are blessed in Georgia for a lot of cooperation, starting with the farmers, all the way down to our scientists. If you look back in 2014, we at the Cooperative Extension Service, about 45 of our largest ag producing counties have documented the number of drift complaint calls that we get. At that time, we had about 289 drift complaints. We implemented using pesticides wisely. Our growers focused mostly on agronomic growers, right? We've never talked to you guys necessarily about this, but focus on the agronomic world. We need on target applications. Our farmers responded amazingly well. You can see where we're at today compared to when we started about a 90% reduction in pesticide drift complaints to the Cooperative Extension Service. All right. Now, why do I bring that up to you? I bring that up to you because if we can't keep our products on target, one could argue we will not remain sustainable. How many of you, raise your hand, how many of you are aware of what is currently going on with the Endangered Species Act and pesticides? Raise your hand. Okay. You see how few people know what's going on. This is happening now. This challenges us like never before, and I'm going to give you just one example. It's an agronomic example. But look, this is going to happen to every pesticide. All right, the buffer may be different, i.e. Stormy's products are going to have a larger buffer than my products. My products will probably have a larger buffer than uh, Babesh's products. Okay, but it's serious. This act was passed in 1973. It is now going to change the world that we live in. If you want to know if you have endangered species, and you're from the state of Georgia, if you have endangered species in the county that you farm in, if it's highlighted in red, you have an endangered species. It may be a plant, it may be an insect, it, it could be any of, any of the above, okay? But this applies to you. If you're outside the state of Georgia, similar situation, your map probably looks just like ours does. 
All right, so one of the products that is actually having, there are about three herbicides right now that have endangered species buffers placed on them. Those buffers are on those labels and our growers are required by law to follow those labels. Currently, two of our products have a buffer that says you have to have a 310 foot downwind buffer and 57 foot omnidirectional. So the way the wind's blowing 310 foot from the wood line, you have to stop spraying. 57 foot around the rest of the field, you cannot spray. All right, so we went in with our county agents and we mapped what kind of impact that would have on Georgia agriculture. I took a best case scenario, I gotta be fair, right? I'm sharing this data with the EPA. If you look on the left, that's a best case scenario. That's a large field, few wood, the smallest amount of wood line surrounding that one field. If you look on the right, I think that more likely represents most of us. If you, if you add up the amount of land we cannot treat legally with that herbicide, in the best case scenario, that's 31% of that farm that grower cannot legally treat. If it's the worst case scenario, that is 49.6% of that farm that grower cannot treat. All right, this is for one herbicide, okay? This is happening on 1,100 active ingredients. Roundup's getting ready to go through. How many endangered species are not sensitive to Roundup? They're all gonna be sensitive to Roundup. Not only do we have to protect the endangered plant species, we have to protect the plant that is critical habitat for Stormy's bugs, right? So it is extremely complex, but you need to know that this is going on. Now, why am I, why am I stressing this to you? We all have a lot to do. You also have to help. If you do not keep your pesticides on target, I don't care if it's a herbicide, a fungicide, or insecticide, there is no way, no way we will be remain sustainable with pesticide labels that are practical or usable. With that said, I'm gonna shut up. The last thing I'm gonna mention, if you have a interest in a watermelon weed control handout, squash handout, or sweet potato handout on this table right up here, they are sitting up here and they're ready for you. We didn't have a chance to laminate the cold crops and the green handouts, but that is up here as well, just in a printed uh, paper format. With that said, any questions or comments for me uh, before I sit down and shut up? All right. Um, just one last thing, make sure you get your uh, badge scan if you would like pesticide credit for this course. And please go enjoy the, uh, the remainder of the education sessions and the trade show.